everybody. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to be concise if I can, because we're running late, I realize. Um, but I wanna pick up just on the previous couple speakers as well. I think it's an important link as we like move now from Asia to um, South Africa, to the continent and to South Africa particularly. Um, where we have our, uh, they're called, uh, affectionately known as the red ants, um, the, the um, private policing and government policing who come to evict people um, in South Africa. So yeah, the, the conflection of private and, um, and state-led um, eviction is maybe one of the places that started getting me more interested in looking at how, um, how we think about rights, who they serve, and, um, and how they function um, at the moment for social justice work around the city. Um, and I just wanted to, I changed the name of my presentation as well to a kind of fascism that um, I'll explain um, briefly as we go through. But um, basically I want to both talk a little bit to the specificities of Johannesburg, but also um, really pose some questions about the function of the discourse around the right to the city for social justice organizing at the moment and some of the um, problems it poses and maybe some of the questions that we can ask about it. Um, and definitely I feel kind of um, a, a certain kind of emotional moment of, of speaking about this current difficult time in, in South Africa, the day that Nelson Mandela died. Um, as well as thinking through the legacy of Neil Smith in relation to some of these questions who also left so recently. And I think thinking about what his work was doing helped me think through some of the problematics as well in um, the South African context. Um, so just for those of you who don't know, Sapiro is always more succinct than I am at just explaining what's going on in contemporary South Africa. And I think um, as this uh, cartoon shows really well, um, you know, while we can talk about the, all of the specificities geographically of neoliberalism as it works around the world, South Africa was um, um, actually really wholeheartedly adopted a lot of the kind of fiscal reform policies um, imposed by the IMF. Um, and really like took on board, as this illustrates quite hilariously, um, what neoliberalism um, as understood by the international financial organizations looked like um, uh, in these, you know, IMF World Bank and the WTO sort of like um, laughing at um, how amateur actually apartheid um, uh, in one country was be, would be as they developed a kind of global apartheid um, in which South Africa was quick to join onto, um, a lot of us believe, um, which looked at sub subsidized overconsumption um, of the first world for a so-called trickle-down economy to the third. So to give you a little um, flavor of what, um, where we're going to go in the inner city of Johannesburg, um, just to give you a sense of like, this is, South Africa is a country that continues to be, and actually increasingly so, um, of extreme inequality. Um, this is a couple photographs that I just randomly took from the internet of Santon, one of the northern suburbs, where um, the inner city, um, which was the central business district, fled to create a kind of new business district in Santon, north of the city. So where we're about to go in the inner city is actually where white capital fled um, at the end of apartheid as, as the... Um, um, Group Areas Act opened up and people were actually able, black people were actually able to come back into the city. Um, white capital got quite nervous and fled the city and, and sort of sort of this kind of process of, um, of moving around of capital and of, of money move. So this is a, 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 f a quote from recently talking about the amazing increases in property values in Santon. Um, Sarah Britton, this is um, taken from Business Day. It's amazing how we can live in proximity to incredible poverty and not worry too much about it. Um, of course, crime is one we're reminded too often. So it's not only a place of extreme class division and inequality, but also of insulation um, through, you know, high, from high walls to um, all kinds of other types of policing and security that allows places like this um, and, you know, I had to put Nelson Mandela, you know, this is the little person, this is in Santon, and the, in the, the, the centerpiece of Santon is a gigantic shopping mall, which is um, Nelson Mandela Square is the centerpiece of, um, in all of the irony that that presupposes. 
um, to the inner city and um, the shack settlements around the country where people are in um, literally um, an on-the-ground um, combat um, constantly. So I renamed my presentation from a quote from Mondli um, Makana from uh, just a few days ago in City Press who titled his article, Hear Me Out While I Make a Case for a Kind of Fascism, which I think is really illustrative of the moment that we're in in South Africa right now, which is also why it's so mournful, um, the hope that, that died with Mandela today. Um, and so Mondli, who was the editor-in-chief of um, a, a major newspaper and has been a major uh, media figure within South Africa, wrote, um, these images you see here are from a few weeks ago where right now what's going on is called Operation Clean Sweep in the Johannesburg inner city. Um, I'll come back to the kind of thoughts on Neil Smith and, and maybe what we're also seeing, um, what we saw in New York City also kind of resembling what we're seeing in inner city Johannesburg. But he said, wrote in um, an editorial in City Press, these proponents of grime will have us believe that tolerating the hawkers who clog pavements and leave behind tons of rubbish when they close shop at night is good for the city's economy. They could not be more wrong. Chaotic pavement trading has been one of the main contributors to the decline of our main CBDs. Um, so you can see like within a short span of time, um, under the understanding of what the end of apartheid meant to the inner city of Johannesburg, what, how, um, so it's quite a long and complicated story, which unfortunately I can't tell you right now, but um, to this kind of, of um, viewpoints that are circulating, this was quickly contested in, in um, city press the following day, but this is the kind of debate that's now taking place in public, in the public space. And, just those images at the bottom are actually from forced evictions that I photographed in um, Durban area and shock settlements around the country. So these are not isolated incidents, hawkers, street traders, but also buildings are, are being evicted. Um, huge swaths of inner city Johannesburg are being um, uh, gentrified, basically. So what do those look like? Um, they look like revolution. So. Um, yeah, and I want to situate my discussion of, of um, a question on what the right to the city means in this context through um, this kind of reoccupation of the inner city by middle class suburbanites within South Africa. Um, so in March 2012, the last phase of development was being done on Revolution House that you see pictured here the latest in a multi site development in the Mabinang precinct in Johannesburg downtown. Gleaming porcelain bathtubs reflect the ref and refract the city's iconic skyline. That this swanky urban development and its high-end penthouses, soon to be homes for elite professionals, was named Revolution House, foregrounds the project's numerous contradictions. What is the revolution exactly that Revolution House refers to? As I'll argue in this article, the revolution is precisely the return to the city for the suburban and aspirant up upper and middle classes. It's the reclamation of Johannesburg's downtown by those who had been displaced, or more accurately, who had fled the city after the end of apartheid. It's a right to the city asserted by those who can do so and who feel they have lost the possibility of the city, relegated to the suburbs and protected by wall security guards and gated communities. Those deprived suburbanites who have lost all of the urban chic the city center had to offer and who have now come to take it back. Um, so this is quite literally um, being articulated by the middle classes. Um, and um, I wanted to, so the Mabinang Precinct is actually also a named um, neighborhood um, reconfigured and, and branded um, as Mabinang um, neighborhood over pre-existing urban neighborhoods, city and suburban in Jeffystown. And this image here is from 1955, We Won't Move. It's a kind of icon of Sophia Town forced removals that happened um, during that period of time at the beginning of the Group Areas Act when people were forcibly removed based on the color of their skin into other neighborhoods. And this, this is sort of um, an iconic image and also this idea of people resisting um, the, forced, the, the forced dislocation um, from their communities and from their homes. Um, fast forward to 2012, and we're in the Mabinang precinct, and We Won't Move is, is um, graffitied on the, the walls of, of um, the roof of one of the developments in the course of its, its transformation. 
Um, so the reference directly recalls the same slogan painted on walls during the forced evictions that happened not far from here in the racially mixed area of Sofia Town by the apartheid government. The slogan asks for many readings. One might think residents being displaced by the swanky new lofts and penthouses had painted it there. But a more likely reading is that it was the developers and the city hipsters themselves who had painted it. In an even more ironic twist, that the once displaced white wealth that used to inhabit the city is now coming to claim it back. Um, and that was my kind of first feeling about what, who had written this, you know, what was actually the meaning of this slogan. And, and um, actually, that turned out to be exactly the case. As a quote here, and I put revanchist urbanism because I think that, like, again, we think of Neil Smith's ideas about what um, this kind of, um, is this a revanchist turn? Is it something else? And, and is it also operating within um, a, a, a language of rights taking? And I think that's kind of the important piece that I want to add to maybe the revanchist story. So um, by one of the this is a quote by one of the musicians who was um, who was playing this um, rooftop uh, kind of hip performance of urban life in Johannesburg. We felt like everyone was leaving the city again, like the hype had faded. You know, you have people who came for the wrong reasons, made their money and left, but the city is still alive. And he goes on as well. I'll just finish this quote. Um, and um, this is Pumi from Black Jacks, so a very well-known um, South African band, um, asked whether he found the Sophia Town reference contradictory in terms. Um, he says, um, the empty buildings have been chosen as venues because they are no longer what they once were and not yet what they will soon become. They were chosen for their transitory nature, chosen to attract people back to the city, and the words on the wall imply that people never left. Well, we're all back now, he says, smiling as if to avoid the trap. We're taking ownership of our cities. It's as if we never left. I ask if he thinks the Sophia Town reference is racially exclusive. That'll be easier to answer, no. Um, so I think that um, the We Won't Move kind of sets up quite a, quite a bit of this story about what's starting to happen and what I want to talk about in terms of um, inner city Johannesburg. So this is an overhead shot of the Mabinang precinct. Um, so it's about three city blocks. Um, Mabinang is uh, a Zulu word meaning the city of light, you know, um, chosen by um, the young South African entrepreneur and property developer Jonathan Liebman. Um, after traveling the world, Liebman comes back to Johannesburg and says, I couldn't stand living in the suburbs, so I had the option to leave South Africa or to try and create an urban space to live and work in. He's quoted um, as saying that. So this is 2008 at age 23. Um, Liebman bought uh, his first warehouse in, and began at the arts-oriented complex called Arts on Main. Um, this was followed by the incorporation of his property development company, Propertuity. By 2012, Propertuity had bought 25 buildings in the area. Um, he's hoping to increase that to 100 buildings. Um, and and they're really, it's a really branded type of project. They talk a lot about it in terms of sort of a New York urbanism. It's going to be, it's like a, immediately, you know, they, they literally gave artists free spaces to live in um, to make it kind of have the hip artists live here by, you know, none of the multi-stepped gentrification that we see in other, it's actually an entirely superimposed, um, created, um, you know, uh, Brooklyn style development. Um, so in Mabinang, the desire for centrality to be in the city has le um, led to a huge swaths of urban territory being turned into privately controlled, individually um, conceptualized and corporately branded urban enclaves. The vision of one young man and the wealth of his international financier have superimposed a new neighborhood privately held and managed over the history and geography of the city. So what does this say about the conception of the right to the city for the urban poor and um, for developers and suburb suburbanites like the one in Mabinang? So I chose this uh, Merrifield quote that I thought was quite interesting. Um, and he says, if urbanization is planetary, if the urban or urban society is everywhere, is this right to, this, to the city, the right to the metropolitan region, right to the whole urban amalgamation, or does it just mean the right to a certain neighborhood? to the city's downtown, the right to centrality. And if there are centers everywhere, just as there are multiple peripheries, does that mean the right of these peripheries to occupy, take back the centers? 
Um, so what are we actually talking about? What city are we talking about when we're saying the right to the city seems to me a question that we don't often ask. I mean, right, period, is, as I'll come to later, is also not really even problematized as what does that mean um, in the kind of discourse that is popular being used. Um, so there's Jonathan. Um, rebel with the cause. Again, I think Neil Smith really comes to mind with the kind of front, the, what you talked about in terms of frontier urbanism. This is absolutely the, the language that's being used in South Africa. South Africa really enjoys, um, uh, not South Africa generally, but Johannesburg specifically, a gold mining town really um, uses ca uh, kind of ca cowboy capitalist iconography often, and um, the new development is definitely one of those that we see. They said, too risky, too much crime, don't do it. He's, he didn't listen. From derelict warehouse to a portfolio of 30 properties, meet Jonathan Liebman, the entrepreneur who breathed into downtown Josie and started a cultural revolution. Again, the, the kind of revolution, um, both the kind of urban uh, cowboy terminology as well as the sort of like use of the word revolution, you know, we're using, drawing on Sophia Town um, imagery and also uh, language around rights. All these are kind of coming together. Um, so Liebman, did I put this quote? Yeah, I love this, the, the still of him on a television show, The Entrepreneurial Edge, um, the, the, he started a laundry business when he was a teenager or something. <laughs> he was 23 when he started this, so. But um, this is a great, quite controversial quote from Liebman um, uh, that was published in the Mail and Guardian, where he says, one must be very careful about developing a downtown or inner city that only caters for the needs of the poor. To make a good city, he says, the middle income and the rich must also be looked after in addition to the poor. Maybe some people should be in the inner city and others should be on the outskirts of the city. Maybe, um, and and I think what Lee, uh, what Liebman tries to uh, set up here, which is happening in many of these development projects, is a, a discourse that both appeals to the huge amounts of money that they're getting from the redevelopment bodies within um, the state, which, which is looking for um, low-income housing to be developed and um, a more inclusive, multi-use type of spaces to be built, um, but then also is branding it as a place that is going to be friendly to the middle classes and the aspirant, um, you know, the aspirant middle classes more than the upper classes, really. It's still Johannesburg and it's still, um, it is still cowboy, dangerous, inner city sort of living. So there's part of that appeal to it. Um, and, and the, some of the kind of arguments that are, that are made that I write about a bit in the paper also um, around how not, not privatizing the area is going to contribute to marginalizing and excluding people further, you know, and that, that, that actually that, that the only way to, 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 to sort of save people from their, their um, situation is to bring a mixed use sort of um, bring wealthier people, people close. Now, I think there's fairness to some of that kind of argument, but I think that um, it's actually not really what's, what's happening. Okay, I'm gonna try and go a bit faster. So, part of what I've been doing is, in my own research um, and, and practice, as a, I guess as an activist and an artist as well, is also countering and disrupting gentrification narratives through the ins insertion of the narratives that exist in those spaces. You know? and, and I think it's like one thing to identify um, that this is bad, what's going on, but it's also like, what exactly do we do to counter it? So one of the things we did in Johannesburg was we decided to, to um, make a film, Jumping on a Friday, that was um, a neighborhood documentary that looked uh, that did not say Mabinang ever, did not interview those developers, but actually looked at what the practices were of the neighborhood that exists there, that is being erased um, and, and um, talked about as though it never existed in the first place. Um, so we sort of tried to document it's both possibly a historic project if those those voices get completely marginalized, but also we felt like one of, of um, publicly disrupting the kind of story that they could tell about what they were doing with those spaces. Um, so I want to show you the little demo of that. Yeah, so this is just a couple images from Chubby. And so in Jack Piano Friday, actually the demo will just give you some images, so just to set up what it is, we, um, and I can speak more about this at um, the break or whatever, but there we followed five different narratives, but we, we um, traced the lives of um, a, 
um, every street, all of the merchants, everyone who lived in the neighborhood, and then brought filmmakers, local filmmakers, to document the stories of many different people. And then we followed, over the course of one day, the lives of five different people who lived and worked in the neighborhood um, uh, from an uh, urban uh, land re um, recycler, you know, one of the, who pushed the trolleys, to um, uh, an escadamia. This is, um, this Robert um, lives in the Jeffy's Men's Hostel, a home of up to 10,000 men who are part of the migrant barracks that still exist in that neighborhood, um, men's workers' spaces, um, to an Indian shopkeeper who had been there um, from um, multi-generations as well, of the last remaining kind of indentured workers that still, the history of indentured work in the neighborhood. So let me just show you that. Just a little teaser of one minute. Uh, yeah, just a little quick teaser of the film, which is um, too long to play here. It's um, 80 minutes or something like that. So we uh, we do follow one of the developers also who lives in the penthouse in the new developments and sort of look at them together. Where am I at in terms of time? I didn't. Seven minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So in that case, I'll just speed right to the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, which, you know, so given all of this, um, you know, again, this is sort of a retelling of the same story I've been telling, but I think this, like, amazing photo of this sort of the authentic experience of, like, you know, you can play your guitar with the street kids, and, you know, there's, like, a whole, a whole kind of, of story being told in this place, particularly in um, a, a little quote from the Invisible Committee there. But um, I guess, let me just... So what about rights and recognition? And if the middle class are reclaiming the right to the city, um, how do we understand and who's using the right to the city actually? Anyways, like for one, like what movements are using it and how are they using it? Are they using it? And is it even about rights language? Is that what we're talking about? And who whose rights for who? This is actually um, a photo from a building that I started actually filming in that, that's home to um, blind migrant Zimbabweans who have occupied an inner city building, like 200 blind people, that I started working on a film on, but then the people were, not only were they like, we don't care about the film, we're blind, but they were just like, it's too dangerous for us to be visible, like what's the point? And ethically it just became like, yeah, this is actually not, uh, they're actually surviving by occupying these buildings, by being invisible. Our drawing visibility to them has a faith in, in, a, in a sort of system that they know much better than we do is not going to work for their interests. And, and so they were carving out a kind of um, safe spaces to, it's not safe, it's terrible situation that they're living in. You know, this is not a romantic story in any of the options that I'm proposing, but it's one that's like realist, proposing a realist for like the kind of absolute antagonism and conflict that we're, we're like currently like living within and what kind of global neoliberal capitalism that, that a sort of liberal democratic 
um, rights-based discourse, I think, totally um, pretends is not happening. And this is happening. So, um, you know, as it, um, you know, to be nothing socially is not a humiliating condition, the source of some tragic lack of recognition, to be recognized, but by who? But on the contrary, is the precondition for maximum freedom of action. Okay, there's a certain kind of romanticism with that, but I also think I pose some other questions. What are the benefits of not being legible? I think as, I mean, Solomon also talked, talks about the messy bits between the, the cracks, anonymity, opacity, um, practices that are not state-facing but reinforce mutual aid, local solidarities, um, invisible occupations. Um, what are the ways that we can actually, like the, the tidal wave of um, gentrification um, of uh, global neoliberal capitalism is everywhere. We're like facing so many multiple crises right now. How do we save space seems to be the question. It seems to be the most pressing, not um, how do we ask the state, what state, the, the global community to protect our right to what exactly occupy our shock settlements? Is that what we're asking for? Is that what progressive social you know, justice is asking for, which is what it's looked like in South Africa, where it's been um, in situ upgrading has become like, you know, this is a big win to like stay in your shack, you know, to stay in conditions that are like basically unlivable. Um, so yeah, basically the questions I know that asking is right to the city is not, a, you know, as many of you here have dealt with much longer than I have is not a new question, but I do think it really needs rethinking because I think that actually people from spaces like this come back and translate to movement spaces that this is actually a viable kind of model for political action. And I don't know that we don't do disservice if not even damage movements by, by speaking in this kind of language. <laughs> Maybe not, you know, it's a question I pose. Um, yeah, and you know, is, while I, I don't want to pretend like gaining rights is nothing, you know, like, and I, and I think that that's really important to state in what I'm saying. I don't think, I, I'm, I'm just saying, in what way can we understand it also as tactically or strategically a, a, a different kind of um, position. So, and I think that one of the, why I use the South African example of um, we won't move was also because right is being so normal, normalized right and voice as being these two kind of paired concepts that are being so normalized within society that the middle class suburbanite, white suburbanite, who did not grow up during apartheid, who is a young person now, does not um, see right as functioning within an unjust society. It sees right as functioning as an equalizer for all. And they are also holders of that right. And they assert that, that that's the way that they use that kind of understanding. It's like it, within the kind of liberal framework. But I think that that's, to re, like reinscribe the structural inequality based on it. Um, so yeah, uh, also I'll skip down like ri the rise of enclaves versus um, democratic liberal models of a smooth kind of state able to enforce laws. Like if we're looking at more enclaves, um, does that change the way? That's a question as well. Like, do, like who are we addressing exactly if enclaves are actually becoming more predominant? Because basically an enclave like we see in Mabinang they're actually doing the refuse pickup, the lights, you know, they're doing absolutely all of the, the um, infrastructure delivery in that neighborhood. Once they've taken the state money to redevelop it, they're using the rents to um, pay for the, the local servicing and they basically don't have the same uh, relationship. Um, and then, yeah, quelling class antagonisms to me is, is uh, something I could talk about more too as we've seen movements turn towards it, the judiciary as a, a solution through, um, and which has had some pretty problematic results. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions there. Ultimately, I think, and actually uh, on your work, Don, I think that kind of the questions about where you brought up actually the Tushina thing of whose right is right, and I mean, is it the people with most power who end up, um, their rights are the ones that are trumped, and I think that's really important. I, I really like Radha D'Souza's work on that as well. She talks about struggles around um, water, and, and it's D'Souza that quotes Marx in the, um, you know, in this kind of talking about, and I'm almost finished here, so. Um, yeah, talking about how uh, the Constitution contains its own antithesis. He's talking about the French Constitution here. Um, as long as the name of freedom was respected and only its actual implementation was prevented in a legal way, it goes without saying, 
Its constitutional existence remained intact and untouched, however fatal the blows dealt to it in its actual physical existence. And um, again, to me, this is great in the um, reference to the Johannesburg constitutional situation and when we see an amazingly progressive constitution that is constantly, constantly um, disrupted and disrespected by the, you know, as we, right now, um, Project Clean Sweep is doing, um, which is actually against constitutional law and there's a court case ongoing right now. So I'm gonna end here, which is around the question of of uh, stay and stay up, but also I think coming back to that upgrading, is this what we're asking for? Where where, where does the discourse lead us? But this is Mabinang Precinct and a graffiti that was um, made by an outsider coming into the neighborhood. Um, many different graffiti artists, there's all, you know, and they wrote this stay up, which sort of draws to mind some kind of like all night party or, you know, what exactly, what are we, what are we asking you to stay in the neighborhood, stay up? Um, right next to um, a group of people who are literally under the bridge, right beside that graffiti, living under it after being evicted from one of the buildings right next door. Um, and, you know, the interplay of stay up with the we won't move, um, through these kind of graffiti enactments of, of assertion of a certain kind of claim and right on, on the city, I think have to be taken into account um, when we think about how strat strategically and politically we can move forward around political struggles for social justice in the city. Um, and just to end on a positive note, <laughs> um, I think right to the city is not the only way to think about um, social justice organizing. I just pulled um, building a solidarity city, the concepts of solidarity a city that are being articulated by social justice movements currently, which really emphasize um, mutual aid. This is from Canada. This is um, from uh, solidarity across borders, migrant justice organizing groups that are are talking about in Montreal, Vancouver, and, and Toronto, talking about trying to build solidarity cities, which working with local organizations build on mutual aid on the ground in the cities. So from healthcare to um, housing issues to local gardens, you know, to actually build tangible um, networks of resistance. Okay, thanks. I think, was, uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, we constantly have to question rights and their utility and their value and so forth. But a lot of the trouble I have with the rather fashionable dismissal of rights is that I think totally misunderstands what rights are. Uh, rights are not a discourse, rights are not a language, and rights are not only liberal, right? Rights are practices. They're legal relations mm -hmm. and social relations of all kinds. Liberal rights are one form of rights, right? There are all kinds of other mm -hmm. rights, including collective rights, that have to be struggled for. Rights are also a struggle, and that's a crucial mm -hmm. piece of it. And much of the, the, the dismissal of rights focuses simply on a very narrow language of rights, which is about liberal individualism. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, therefore, dismisses all the struggles for collective engagement mm -hmm. through rights, through practices, through legal structures, right, that allow for a different way of living and being in the city. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I find a real difficulty mm -hmm. with, with this. And that's why you know, Tushnet, I think, raises important questions, but gets it entirely wrong mm -hmm. in his argument, because he dismisses the language of rights mm -hmm. rather than the practice mm -hmm. of rights, which he doesn't address at all. Mm -hmm. And then another piece with that is that a lot of people who, who take rights very seriously do question them all the time. And one of them who does it the best, I think, is, is uh, my now colleague, former student, Capriato, in critique of me, right, who lays out very, very clearly the different ways of understanding what the rights of the city might be, and think about what rights are in a, in a very, very helpful way. Um, and suggest that I get it wrong in that. But yeah. I think he does it in a very nice way because he takes them so seriously in a way that I think a lot of the, the critical language of rights does not. Mm. Okay. Uh, should I answer? Well, I mean, I think in South Africa, um, I mean, I totally hear you, and I guess I, I was kind of swiping both with one brush, but actually in South Africa, I think we could have a like longer and pretty specific question about the like real legal, I mean, that's why 
the constitutional court cases, the specific whims and repeals uh, around that. I mean, for example, Ashwin Dessa just wrote recently about how if you actually look at all the contestations around rights, specific rights within law, um, the only ones that have been accepted by the constitutional or the high court judgments have been ones that had no economic implication. So, I mean, like, yeah, let's bring it practical. And when we look at it practically, it also reinforces like class a lot of class dynamics that I think are more like are important to expose. So, you know, I'm not. Yes, that's language not, is one that's thing. That's not but. an argument for dismissal of rights. That's an argument for transforming what the struggles are about. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, yeah, possibly. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, the. I think that it. It's still if you're if you're taking a movement who are, for example. Um, finding other solutions and bringing them into a court that's going to constantly um, err on the side of, of class in like against them or will be an, an, like what we, we saw such massive demobilization by going towards like the so-called tangible rights which weren't always won and actually it, it de demobilized tons of other kinds of strategies that were possibly more effective on the long term like I think it's a practical discussion I mean it is about about what tactically are people going to do? Yeah, I feel like I should take another question. Yeah. I, I was I, I really enjoyed the, the talk uh, and, and the, the things that you showed. Uh, I was a little confused about at least two things. Uh, one is kind of like uh, you you referred to Neil Smith's idea of the the frontier mentality, the wild west, you know, and you talked about cowboys and so on. So I was kind of like quite a little bit hard for me to kind of like relate that, you know, to to figure out, uh, uh, to relate that to South Africa, unless you could very briefly tell me where mm -hmm. was the frontier, you know, like where were they going, what was the Wild West, you know, and, mm -hmm. and so on. But secondly, when you when when you bring back bring it back, as you know, Neil Smith did, uh, that you know, like uh, the new frontier being the inner city, uh, what comes to my mind is kind of like the the, the the white flight and the kind of like leaving out the African American people in the middle of the city and then eventual uh, 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 denationalization and so on. Is that the situation also in South in, in Johannesburg, or, or is it something different that you're talking about? White flight coming back into the city? Sorry? No, no, yeah. I mean, when you, when you talk about these two, I, I gave you my images yeah. that comes to my mind, because, I mean, um, Neil Smith refers to yeah. uh, the, the frontier mentality, mm -hmm. the cowboys, okay, yeah, got uh, it, yeah. where the United States expanded to the, to the, yeah. to the west, where, you know, I mean, the, and, and so on. And then, then when he brings back the argument, he also talks about, you know, like how the you know, inner city needs to be tamed, you know, like, I mean, and, yeah. and, and, and in my imagination, there's all these African-American people and all the people that the white people wanted to leave uh, mm -hmm. in, in the middle of the city who were criminalized and, you know, and, and, and so on. But he's, he's, you know, uh, I couldn't kind of like get a handle on how these two, met, you know, which you probably use metaphorically, mm -hmm. uh, how they are related to South Africa. Yeah. Do you wanna do you wanna answer ask your question too? Oh, um, just uh, just because I'm sure we're running out of time. Oh, okay. uh, no, I was just wondering just to um, uh, add to what um, uh, uh, when we're thinking about rights, is it that uh, we are looking at the law as a specific institution as, or as a constitution, or are we also then thinking about the, the practice of law. I mean, if you get into uh, the various practices that then can be constituted as law, then if you move it right. in, I think in the way you are uh, talking about it, if, if it moves into claims that are made, and there are contestations over territory by various claiming groups, and rights is then a much broader concept. Uh, I wonder whether that's one way of uh, thinking about the issue, which then um, doesn't necessarily pose what both of you are saying in a kind of a binary. Mm. Uh, so I'm, 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 I wonder whether sometimes there's a mix up, because you mentioned also smooth state, you know, and I think that's a useful one mm -hmm. because uh, uh, if there's a discourse by, you know, Picture groups who say, "Oh, yeah, you know, that we also want the law to operate, or the rule of law, which is often used as a way to 
say that you know hawkers are illegal and the, the term itself hawkers rather than vendors. Yeah. Then it's always posed as a rule of law is we have to implement the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And their conception of law is a very different one than if you think of it as a practice of claims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is yet. Yeah, I think in South Africa because con the constitution is the most is has been and, and because the constitution operates in a rights language, um, even though the High Court is, is a step along the way, like that actually like the the way of under like actually a lot of the claims um, like the prevention of illegal, the PI Act, the prevention of illegal evictions, and um, is operates within a framework that draws upon the constitutional right to um, to housing. So actually, in South Africa, the language of rights and the claims are very linked, and maybe I'm conflating them, and that doesn't work in other contexts. But I do think that they're. But I, I also. So I think in that sense, because that constitutional imperative that a lot of the social movements use. It seems important to speak about it, not in an abstract way, but actually in a practical way. And though, but yeah, I think that it needs more working out and um, more specificity, absolutely, too. And in terms of the Wild West, like actually Joburg is um, a gold mining place. Like it's the largest urban um, environment that was built not on a water source because it was um, it's a it's a mining it's a mining town. So the Wild West iconography within even the late teen, um, 1800s when it was first being settled, the kind of cowboy aspect has always been part of the discourse of it, not like the American cowboy, but the South African cow. Like the, that is actually a, a, a an imagery that that continues to the day. And people call people going to Joburg gold diggers and. You know, they, there's like a kind of idea of a frontier mentality within South Africa, I think. So I, I feel like the Neil Smith thing isn't just a, it's actually a pretty useful, um, it's a, it, it, it works fairly useful, usefully in the South African context. And yes, and it is a similar thing of white um, flight for different reasons, historic reasons, but leaving the city and then, and then returning, yeah. What, what I'm trying to say is in, in, Neil Smith's, in Neil Smith's argument, they are very, 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 very connected. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's this mentality, and which kind of like brings back. Yeah, And now the, the wild west is gone. Uh, the capital is now trying to tame the tame the inner city. I mean, the absolutely. Inner city, the inner city. Yeah, taming the disorderly city, the, the book by Murray recently, it's not like an amazing book, but it's still, I think that that kind of language, taming the city and kind of dominating, it, like it's it, it's very much alive in the way of thinking, people are thinking during this work. Okay, All right. yeah, Thank <laughs> thanks. It's uh, time for lunch. Um, given this schedule, um, we will have only, so to speak, um, you know, one hour for lunch. As a result, uh, I plan to uh, uh, give you a taste of what fast food is all about in Hong Kong. <laughs> so what this is what we are going to so uh, we will eat our lunch downstairs in the cold place as well. So it's the fast food. So everyone is uh, like uh, the uh, sweet sleeper, you know, given a, a box of rice and then that's it. Yeah. Okay. So.